Released on January 6th of 2003, Wolf's Reign is a gorgeous show that gets spooky, deep, and really dramatic. Without a doubt, this is another addition to the list of absolute bangers that have been dropped by Studio Bones. There are 30 episodes in total, the final four of which were released as OVAs around a year after the original air date. At the helm directing this project was Tensai Okamura, and supplying visions to bring to life was writer Keiko Nobumoto. Here are some other projects that Keiko and Tensai respectively have had their hands in under the same roles. I'd like to emphasize the shout out to Keiko, who sadly passed away last year. She's the biggest reason one of my favorite shows ever is so god dang fantastic. We also got Yoko Kano on the beat. Thank you for existing, Yoko Kano. The insinuation with all of this is that today's topic is of a higher quality. I'm not going to be able to avoid spoilers in talking about most of this material, so there will be minor spoilers all throughout. I'll try to avoid them as best as possible, but it's a little hard sometimes. Anytime I feel the need to drop some heavier forbidden knowledge about the show, I'll leave a warning and a time to skip. Don't let your guard down. They say there's no such place as paradise. Even if you search to the ends of the earth, there's nothing there. No matter how far you walk, it's always the same road. It just goes on and on. But in spite of that, why am I so driven to find it? calls to me. It says, search for paradise. Wolf's Rain takes place in a world on the brink of collapse. Several wars have absolutely ravaged the planet, leaving most of the land barren. The few supply-starved cities we see in the show are a handful of depressing colonies scattered across a post-apocalyptic Russia. Up above in strange airships, nobles deal in tainted magics, and in the world outside, most species have gone entirely extinct, the most noted being wolves. Interestingly enough, information on wolves is scarce and often held under scrutiny. There's banned literature concerning them, namely the Book of the Moon that you'll hear about throughout the story. The truth is, wolves aren't actually extinct. The few remaining wolves have learned to use magic to make themselves appear as humans. There's an important distinction to make here, they don't turn into humans. It, it's apparently an illusion. I say this because I thought they were like anamorphs or some shit for the first few episodes. Looking across the internet, I'm not the only one who was confused by this either. One of the wolves holds a knife against someone earlier on. Wolves speak fluent English to humans at eye level, and there are numerous scenes where the wolves do other human things or get hurt, and it doesn't really translate super good between forms. Here is an example. You'll never fool me again! The wolf in this scene has gained the ability to stand on its hind legs and spread its front ones like Jesus on the cross. Where was he shooting? There is no answer to the logistics of this, it just works. All of the supernatural and technological stuff in the series is about the same. There are people made of flowers, psychic alchemy powers, and ships that defy physics in multiple ways. Peep these laser games. The most you're going to get in the way of a loose explanation for any of this are the careful lore drops throughout the show. Most being from that banned book I mentioned called the Book of the Moon. Not much of an explanation in most cases, more like the writer telling you, it do be like that sometimes. I'm not explaining shit. And once again, she, she for real does not explain shit. These lore drops are mostly fairy tales and folklore that serve to add more intrigue. The dramatic tone of the show includes the capabilities of the less human characters, so in tandem with the rest of the setting, the lore drops, and that singular goal stated at the beginning, it all just works. Don't think about it. There could have been explicit detail and lengthy explanations about why the laser beam could curve, but that's not what the show is about. This is a character drama. 
The setting is simply a tool to mystify the viewer while the characters bump into each other, interact on the way to their goals. I give the setting a 7.5 out of 10. It's a little spooky, a little unique, a little high-tech, both post- and pre-apocalypse. There are wolves. And is Russia. <laughs> Loved it. it. Could have been quite a bit more fleshed out, but the focus isn't here, once again. Because it's here. The characters are... They're all pretty great. These are wolves, this is a flower, these are nobles, and these are just regular old humans. Regardless of what I just said, all of them are fleshed out pretty decently. To some degree, you can empathize with each and every one of them. This is because the writing in this show is good, and the characters have a tendency to feel human or human-esque, if you will. What I mean by this is that while everyone speaks the same language and conveys emotions in a human way to the audience, the flowers still do flower things and the wolves still do wolf things. But it manages to be relatable because they display emotions in a human manner so we can recognize them. Here is an example. There's a risk that comes with almost everything. But if you're strong enough, you can always get food. Survival of the fittest. It's the one rule that applies no matter where you go. This city isn't really so bad. I found a place where I truly belonged. This character is troubled by his thoughts. <sighs> oh man, I just wanna howl my head off! This character is also a wolf who is now enjoying himself. Nice characterization. The example works better if you've seen more of the show and how this wolf, Sume, behaves on average. Usually he's a moody bad boy, but right now he's with the boys. These are the boys. This, this is the main squad. When it gets to this point in the show, you understand the cast pretty decently and you know they've gone through some stuff. Seeing them able to relax and enjoy something along with the often moody Sume in particular lightening up kind of hits. To add to what makes them feel human, the mistakes the cast makes while moving towards their goals are, just like the emotions they display, made to feel relatable in a human way. Kind of. Could use Sume for this, but instead of the edgy boy in the crew, we're gonna use this guy. This is Toboy. Toboy is the youngest of the main group. Sweet and innocent, but dumb as shit sometimes. He's also quite curious and afraid to hurt others due to various events. Not that he could ever hurt anybody. Look at him, he's just a sweet little boy, big red doggy. Definitely not a bloodthirsty killing machine at all. I consider the following a minor spoiler as it takes place in the first three episodes. If you want to avoid it, please check the time code to skip. In the first three episodes of the show, Toboy has a few interactions with this young girl, Lyra. Lyra gives Toboy some food. Toboy talks to Lyra using the illusion form, but figures out where she lives, then kills her pet bird and brings it back to her as as a gift here it's your bird now initially i thought of this in human terms and figured he was just insane once again they seemed like animorphs at first see how they speak at eye level right here it's easy to get confused in addition to the human emotions displayed the characters in their human forms have mannerisms and distinct ranges of expression that serve to make them feel even more like people Regardless, Toboe here is still definitely a wolf. In this scenario, the show reminds you by having Toboe massacre the bird like he was playing fetch or something. To us, it's obvious where he made mistakes, but even though he's a wolf, we can still kind of understand that he was, he was just trying to make a new friend. Unfortunately for Toboe, being approached by a talking dog who's just killed your pet bird and brought it to you is fucking insane. To Toboe, it made sense. He's a wild animal, and the illusion thing is normal to him. Rarely in the show do humans and wolves genuinely connect. This example was definitely not one of those times. The mischance at a connection and the feeling of being different are what was conveyed during this whole scenario. The humans and wolves are similar, having curiosities, wants, and needs. They are different. My name is Lyra. What's yours? I just said, it's Toboe. I thought that was your dog's name. Where I feel the biggest difference happens is in the goals of the characters. The normal humans tend to have normal human goals, while well, characters like Kiba and Cheza have goals that often feel beyond human understanding. The speech from earlier used to add some dazzle to the setting is actually Kiba's. It's also the opening scene for the series and tells you everything you need to know about him and the shared goal the wolves have of finding paradise. Come 
on, Kiba, tell us, what's Paradise really like? It's an amazing place. The flowers are always in bloom, and there's food everywhere. Oh, and there's beautiful babes all over the place. You mean it? Of course there are. <laughs> I hope so, anyway. You don't know. Just so we're clear here, the wolves have never seen Paradise, apart from, like, in dreams. Probably, maybe, I don't know. It's not for us to worry about, we just understand them and that they want to go there. While they all do share this goal, I'm using Kiba here in particular because he is the main character. The influence this young fly white wolf boy has on the rest of the main pack almost gives them a fanatical obsession with making the dream come true. The wolves travel through cities, deserts, tundras, a Zelda dungeon with a boss fight. It's like this is a holy crusade and the wolves are on a mission from God. The whole quest doesn't initially feel quite so sacred, it's kind of just this idea that gets thrown around a bunch. But then some things happen, and Cheza is thrown into the main cast. That's when the effect really starts to take hold. Cheza is the most difficult to understand goal-wise, though her emotional maturity, wisdom, and gentleness speak volumes of her character, and suggest that we should trust her. The series also makes it clear just how special Cheza is. The Lunar Maiden invokes a sense of wonder in both the cast and the viewer. A quick example of this is when she pets the dogs. That's right. It's very easy to feel skeptical of Cheza because she sits at the border of understanding. Despite this, at every turn, she remains this perfect, pure-hearted being incapable of creating negative emotion. She's like an angel of nature sent to gather the wolves and guide them to safety. We might not understand the chasing after a fictional land with a girl made of flowers. We might not even understand some of the shit that they're saying sometimes. It's only been three stupid days. Yeah, but if we hadn't left the city, we would have something to eat right now. We can last a lot longer if we bask in the moonlight. I traveled a full month once when I did that. Did you say a month? What we do understand is that these are kind beings with an honest vision that is natural. All of the lore in the show additionally points to their reaching paradise as, like, destiny. So, of course we'd root for them. Then there are the rich people who want to mess around with destiny. The nobles are the bad guys of the story. Once again, they get involved in all sorts of ritualistic tech magic, ban information on wolves, and actively seek to kill them. Oh, wait, oh, hold on. Before I forget, this is, uh, this is Hige, my, my favorite character of the main crew. He's a, he's a good guy. Back on topic, the nobles are very cruel. And they're like a chaos that's just constantly threatening to envelop everything. They start out as a group for the cast to be wary of. You'll hear about them in conversation and see these ships flying above everything and then boom, they're there. The atmosphere gets heavier instantly, and danger starts to seek the cast. One of these characters in particular stands out, the series' main antagonist, Lord Darcy. Lord Darcy's goal is to save his beloved the ethereally beautiful and mysterious disease-ridden Hama. Darcy plans to force Cheza to open the path to paradise for him so he can cure Hama. The reasons why make sense and are fleshed out pretty decently, so you feel for him because he misses his waifu. That's Everybody can relate to that, right? He is the bad guy, though, so there, there, there are several issues. Darcy's want is Hamana, but Bro needs to realize that he's stepping over some boundaries to pervert nature just a little bit and he fails to do so. Every step Darcia takes towards his goal leads him closer to the deep end. This is where the character succeeds. The main squad does what they need and continues toward a healthy feeling goal. See, Darcia reads the ancient texts, kidnaps Cheza, and lights up a fucking Without spoiling too much, Darcia does eventually take one too many steps and is pushed off the edge. When that happens, the contrast deepens and the above cycle continues. The wolves' goal of paradise is clarified further, and they feel more righteous than before. Darcy, on the other hand, just becomes more and more insane, and you don't know what he's going to do next, but you're just looking at him when he's on screen, and you're like, what's he up to? This guy, he's got the devil magic. Something's fucking going on here. The things he does and has the potential to do become increasingly more disturbing. Unclean creature, you are not permitted to enter this land. You can go no further. 
I will not allow it. The characters get an 8 out of 10. Dramatic as hell, but damn great. He gay is the best character. He did nothing wrong. Hello. This is being recorded in post. Um, the next part actually has nothing to do with Hige at all. I'm not going to explain what happens with his little character arc because it's a little bit further in and it's actually pretty good. So instead, um, fuck. What I'm really trying to do here is say the next part contains a major spoiler to the plot overall. So if you want to avoid that, please skip ahead to the animation part of the video. That's it. Wolfstrain has a very long, overarching plot, which is fantastic in build-up and execution. To do this, there are both episodics and mini-arcs. It's during these times that the cast bounces off of each other. We learn a little more, and things progress toward a conclusion in a healthy manner. Unfortunately, the subplots encountered while building the main plot aren't always perfect, and some of the climactic battles aren't always great either. That was pretty cool. Let's see the rest of the fight. You damn wolf. All of this first began with your wretched breed. Jump to a scene of other characters in the area while the fight actually happens. Jump back to fight. That's it. Next let's look at a commonly used plot device from the show that calls the characters to action. It was really that easy to find food. I guess Zali's pack wouldn't be doing what they're doing now, would they? Huh? All right, I smell fresh mutton. Oh crap! Get me out of here! My fangs are way too delicate for this. Sume. What happened to Hige? I don't know. We got split up. I'm pretty sure most of the main cast gets captured at some point or another. Sometimes it just feels like a game of prisoner hot potato, and it's almost always for a plot hook or like to separate the group or something. This is especially true with Cheza. Her usual role is just damsel in distress. The show is once again extremely dramatic. When a scenario that doesn't really interest you is thrust onto the cast and the theater kid in each of the characters comes out just a bit too hard, it can get a little boring. Luckily, as I said, the main plot is pretty solid and can draw the viewer back in very easily. The best way the show does this is through the build-up I was talking about earlier. Having the story from the Book of the Moon delivered to the audience in piecemeal to gradually alter your perception of the story is genius. Having those bits of the story read to you as the main cast moves to the next leg of their journey, while Yoko Kano plays a smooth track in the background, is a beautiful experience. Understanding that the fairy tales and lore are steadily proving themselves true, as Yoko Kano plays a sad track in the background, is absolutely transcendent. There's one particular moment in the show towards the end where this kind of hit me all at once. The entire fairy tale had been fully revealed. All of the remaining cast headed towards paradise. Very calm music playing in the background. This moment made me realize that the cast was basically on a death march. Each character has their own thing that they kind of need to overcome, and everybody reaches it by the end of the show, but it's a tragedy in each case, and it's weird because you feel happy, but at the same time, Damn. This show is probably the closest I've come to actually crying in a while, so that's how I know this shit slaps. Unfortunately, in spite of this, the actual structured plot of the show only gets a 7 out of 10. I'd like to score this much higher because of how well everything works towards a conclusion, but the smaller plots that helped to form the whole needed uh, a bit more planning. 
Even if the larger story is great, people get captured way too often and parts of the show feel just a little too idle. That being said, the animation of the show is fucking peak. Classic Bones delivering the absolute best. The shot composition is amazing. There are beautiful landscapes that really help the setting come to life. Here's a city. You can see it looks terrible and complicated. Here's a nice meadow that's supposed to be an illusion of paradise. Not too complex, but very comfy. Here's a place related to the nobles. Very creepy. Once again, Zelda Dungeon. Am I right? Thanks to the amount of work put into the animation, the characters look amazing as well. And as mentioned before, their mannerisms being finely animated further enhances the character. And your ability to, I don't know, understand and relate to them, it's, it's a human thing, right? You see someone gesturing, you're like, oh, I, I get this guy more. He, I understand him better. Enhances the character, all right? Just trust me. And since the setting is dope, the characters are great, and the plots are okay, Having great animation pushes those things to a much further height. The difference between a decent story and a decent story with animation that fucking slaps is always staggering. Same thing with music. Once again, Yoko Kano on the beat. Here's a sample of the opening. Then here's the ending. Been a long road to follow, but then I got in a, a couple of uh, choice tracks. We found a kind of paradise. For hire, just another day. When you are done, you just abuse it, whatever you say. Just like the animation, the music helps push the bass elements upward for a better experience. While well, the animation functions to portray everything in a smooth and crisp manner, the music of the show both sets the tone and amplifies any tension on screen. God bless Yoko Kano. Animation is a clean 9 out of 10, and the music is an easy 10 but I'm biased. Uh, just as an added note here, I, I guess it's sort of appropriate to just kind of throw this in. The, vo the voice acting in both the English and original Japanese is amazing. I'd almost recommend swapping occasionally between episodes just to experience a little bit of both because they are both legitimately very good. Well, that's all the material I feel like writing for this video, so let's wrap up. Overall, with these scores, it's easy to see that I really like Wolf's Reign and strongly believe it to be a great experience. I feel like an 8 total for this one is appropriate for my tastes. I've seen a lot of people give it like a 7.5, but I had a lot of fun watching it, even if it's not perfect from every angle. Give it a shot if you get the chance. It's probably worth it for most people. Anyway, that's the video. Later. Wait up, will ya? You should go back. Your friends are gonna leave you behind. That's okay. Life's pretty boring when it's only guys. 